Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Steve Horwitz is the Charles A. Dana Professor and Chair of the Department of Economics at St. Lawrence University. He's the author of the forthcoming book, Hayek's Modern Family, Classical Liberalism and the Evolution of Social Institutions, which will be released in September. So we're talking today about Friedrich Hayek and maybe we can just start with some biography. Well, uh, Hayek was born in 1899 uh, in, uh, and grew up in Austria, uh, uh, fought in World War I briefly uh, and then returned to Vienna where he pursued – then what was a law degree was the way you studied economics. It's interesting. His family, his father was a scientist, a natural scientist and, and Hayek always had an interest in botany and biology and uh, which I think you know, as we – talk will become important in thinking about evolution and science and some of those things. But he went – he got the law degree and then he uh, went back and studied more economics. Uh, and then the key was, of course, that he became uh, an informal student, not ever official student, but informal student of Ludwig von Mises, became part of uh, Mises' circle in Vienna in the, 19, uh, in the 1920s. Uh, and it was Mises, Hayek says, who uh, converted him away from Hayek's Fabian socialism towards a kind of classical liberalism. Uh, he then worked for Mises for a while uh, and then had uh, by that point sort of established his own identity as an economist. Hayek uh, ended up – he was in the United States for a while in the 1920s where he was studying U.S. monetary theory and the early operation of the Fed. So a lot of his business cycle theory work that we, might well, we may talk about in the 30s, the 20s and 30s and 40s came out of him actually having been in the United States and, and knowing the, the details. He then wound up back in London. He got a, a job as the Tuke Professor of Economics and Statistics at the LSE, which he got on the basis of the lectures he gave there. That became his book, Prices and Production. And he was at the LSE uh, for quite a while. And there he it was, while he was there, he participated both in the socialist calculation debate and the debate with Keynes. And of course, Keynes was his, his friend and, and colleague over, uh, over at Cambridge. Uh, Hayek came to the United States uh, in the 19, late 1940s after the war. Uh, that story is fascinating because it had to do both with his desire to be in the States and he ends up at University of Chicago at the Committee on Social Thought but also was wrapped up with his divorce and somewhat scandalous remarriage. We can talk about that later <laughs> if you want. Uh, and so he's at the University of Chicago, again, not in the economics department but in the Committee on Social Thought uh, through the 50s and, and into the 60s. I can't remember exactly which year but he ends up back in Freiburg, Germany in the early 60s, um, continues to work there. Uh, and then he goes through a really difficult period in the late 60s and into the 70s, suffering from some depression and, and things like that. But he still manages to, to crank out <laughs> law, legislation and liberty in the 70s. And of course, in 74, he shares the Nobel Prize with, with Gunnar Myrdal. Um, and then Hayek passed away uh, in uh, 1991. Uh, 92. 92, think, yeah. 92. Yeah. Rand was 90. No, Rand was 81. 92, yeah. So uh, at the age of 91. He can't quite maybe hit his uh, birthday yet. But um, – he, uh, of course, his last book before he passed away was *The Fatal Conceit* in in 1988. So, you know, you look over the span of uh, over 60 years of of writing and published published work. Did you ever get a chance to meet him? It is one of the great shames of my life that I did not. I just missed him. Um, one of his last – he was at George Mason for I think his last visit to the States. He may have even come to Cato when he was here yeah, too. I think, yeah, I think he did. Yeah. And that would have been 83 maybe and I started at Mason in 85. So I missed him by a couple of years. Now, when did he become – this is a weird way of putting it but yeah. start becoming – more fam famous was well, it in the twenties? Yeah. Was he pretty no, famous? Well, it, it, you know, define you know define yeah, famous yeah, exactly. Uh, yes. His his business cycle work, his academic work in the thirties certainly made him. I mean, getting that job at at LSE was a huge. That was a major thing. So that made him famous within intellectual circles. What made him famous as a public intellectual, of course, was the road to serfdom in, in nineteen forty four, uh, and that book, which was you know obviously controversial in, in in a number of ways, and and a book defending classical liberalism at a time when planning and socialism were at their peak. Uh, it was serialized 
you know, in Life Magazine, Life. Yeah, it was Reader's Digest. Reader's Digest too. But there's also a, there's a there's a Look Magazine version, cartoon version, yeah, serialized in Reader's Digest, right? Um, and so it was sort of all over the p- culture. And he and the story is he came to the United States to deliver lectures on the book, and he was like thinking, you know, typical professor, I'm going to go give a lecture. You know, 50 people will be there, and they had booked him in these huge auditoriums, right, for thousands of people, and he was not prepared for that, but but he handled it, and and certainly that made him. Uh, a, very much a public figure in ways that that he had not been before. Some, in some ways, to his dis, you know his dismay, because he was persu- he he had thought that he'd lost his uh, academic you know cachet gravitas, I guess, because of that book, and felt very strongly going into the late forties and fifties that he somehow had to get that back. Right, he had to remind people he was actually a, a real scientist, uh, not just this guy who wrote these these public intellectual books. So what was the argument of the road to serfdom? Well, uh, it's one of these classic ones where the argument people think it made isn't quite the one it made. Okay, So the version of it that you hear is something like the following, that Hayek argued that any step on the road towards planning, towards greater government control over the economy would inevitably drive us down the road to serfdom into full totalitarianism. Right, so once you st- you know it's the world's biggest slippery slope. Right, once you started down it, boom, you were gone. And it's not what he said. Um, what he said more guardedly was that once you begin to believe that that you need to plan an economy, if you are to pursue that consistently, you will find that you will have to plan other parts of society. That you'll have to take increasing. Your attempts to control society will increase over time uh, and that if you don't recognize that, you can slide down that road to serfdom. But it wasn't this sort of you know, Marxian kind of inevitability. He was – it was a warning. It was in that way like 1984, right? It was a warning that said thinking you can just plan an economy while leaving people free in these other dimensions – is naive, OK, is not going to work. And he – in the book, he traces through the sort of history of planning and where those ideas come from. But the sort of thesis that everyone kind of grappled with was this one, right? And, and he and, – you know, because obviously we can, we can think of places today that have started down that road. Uh, but Sweden. Didn't, Sweden, right. Didn't get all the way. In fact, and they backed up, right? Mm. <laughs> so, so yeah. And, and, and so it wasn't a story in which human agency wasn't present, where we couldn't stop this process. But, but it was one that he said, if you pursue it consistently, you will have to do these kinds of things. And there's some wonderful chapters in that book, um, one called The End of Truth where he talks about how uh, that, you'll, that you'll eventually, if you pursue this, have to engage in all kinds of forms of propaganda in order to persuade people to adopt the set of preferences that's consistent with, right? And the, the other one, uh, one of the most enduring chapters is Why the Worst Get on Top, which is a sort of pre-public choicey kind of story about why once you put power, this kind of power in the hands of the political class, it will attract the people with a comparative advantage in doing the na- doing nasty stuff because they will be the ones who will rise to power. So, so it's you know again. He, and remember, he's writing in the '40s while Nazism and the Soviet, you know, we're seeing both at the same time. And it's a very effective kind of story about both of those uh, not being simply well, Germans are anti-Semitic, therefore, but rather the idea that you've turned this power over to the state. So it wouldn't be surprising that you get people like a Hitler and others who come to power once you believe the state ought to do these things, that the ones who rise to power are the Stalins and the and the Hitlers and the you know. My favorite part about it is is the sort of sociology of the state type mm-hmm. of thing that you mentioned there. And and the real enduring lesson I think when you see in this town and watch the news cycle is that he says basically that they're gonna try and plan something. And my, and my next question is about, is about the planning. But yeah. they're, so they're going to say we're going to say Obamacare or whatever. They're, we're we're going to mm-hmm. plan. We're going to take over some part of the the economy to make it better, make it more fair, whatever mm-hmm. thing. And then when it doesn't work and it won't work because of Hayek's other ideas, which we'll get to, um, they're never going to say, oh, it it didn't it didn't work because we went too far. They're always going to say it didn't work because we didn't go far enough. The problem was the freedom that, that is undercutting the planning and not the planning itself. And that's a very good observation I think about the yeah. sociology of the state. And that's in Mises too by the way. Mises has this wonderful stuff on what, what now gets termed the interventionist dynamic where basically he says, you know, people perceive a problem in, the, in, in a largely market economy. It's more, or less, more times are not caused by the state. They say we have to fix this problem. So we need more state intervention to fix it. The state intervention comes along, creates several problems 
other problems now that, of course, most economists would have anticipated, but leave that aside, <laughs> right? Creates a bunch of new problems, and people say, "Oh my God, we have to solve these problems more state, right?" It's a, the same sort of same version. And what Mises argued is, is again, if you don't recognize this, you're either going to end up going all the way to a more comprehensive form of state control, or you're going to have to realize we got to stop this and, and and back up. So yeah, very. I mean, those are those arguments were were, were deep in that tradition. So why can't they plan. I mean, this is maybe the biggest high question. And, and this goes back to that the socialist calculation debate, and it's related to the if you can you can tie any of these together. Also, yeah. the use of knowledge in society, which which is such an important. So why yeah. doesn't it work? Well. Uh, what Hayek does is to suggest that the fundamental problem in society is a problem of the use of knowledge, hence that famous 1945 article, The Use of Knowledge in Society, and that the problem we have to solve in any society is the fact that the knowledge we need to, to produce, create and do almost anything is dispersed, contextual and tacit, right? That it's dispersed in the sense that different people know different things and so somehow we need to get people to share the little bits that they know. It's contextual in the sense that oftentimes the knowledge relevant for economic – for the sort of rational use of economic resources, for efficient use of resources is knowledge that will only appear when you're in the context of a market economy that draws it out through the competitive process. So that it, the knowledge doesn't really in some sense exist until you're in that game, until you're in that process. And then it's tacit. There are things that we know that we can't articulate. So my, my favorite example of this, though it's less – my students are less likely to get it these days. Um, if you know how to drive a stick shift, right, a manual shift, OK, I ask my students, uh, how do you know when to – what's the hardest thing to learn? Well, when to pull your foot off the clutch, OK? How do you know? How do you know when to pull the foot off the clutch? And there's this no, pause. You just kind of feel that's it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's right. You just kind of know. You kind of, OK, and I'll say to them, do you know? Yeah, I know. Do you drive? The, yeah, because if you pull off too early, right, you know, pull off too late. Ring. So they know but they can't articulate it. And or can you ride a bicycle? If you can ride a bicycle, you're solving these complicated physics equations but you can't articulate what it is. That, so there's all kinds of knowledge like this. A significant portion of the knowledge in, in, in any social system but in an economy in particular – is of this sort. Entrepreneurs specifically have a great deal of things that they have learned from experience that they can't always articulate but that they know. So when you put all these things together, the idea of planning an economy, of trying to create an economic system from the top down would require that you were able to access and gather and make use of all of this knowledge. Yet the knowledge is dispersed, so it's challenging to get it all in one place. It's contextual. It can only exist under certain institutional arrangements. And if it's tacit, the people themselves – because you might say, well, why not we just put everything you – know, everyone gets on the internet, throws everything they know into a computer and we figure out how to allocate it. Well, wait. If you can't articulate it, you can't get it into the computer. Yeah. And the flip side of this then, I mean, so that's – that. The way that knowledge plays out in the economy and the way that the economy and the people in it operate is why planning doesn't work. But it also leads us to the other great idea uh, that Hayek's known for, which is spontaneous order. Yeah, and so for Hayek, uh, spontaneous order is the idea that human institutions and practices are the product of human action, but not human design. And I think that's that's the phrase he liked, and and it comes really from Adam Ferguson, uh, one of the Scottish Enlightenment thinkers that that Hayek loves so much. Um, and the idea here is, is that so many of the things we, in society, in particular economic institutions and practices, uh, evolve over time uh, in ways that no one person designed, although each one of us contributes to through the choices that we make. So again, another example here uh, I, I, with, with students is, uh, I, you know, I teach up north where it snows a lot. We get the we get the snow covering the the quad. Uh, and what happens over the course of the morning, of course, is that these paths get footpaths get worn through the quad as students. You know, walk from class to class. Same thing with tracks in the woods. Hayek uses that example too. There's no one out there with a sign saying, hey, everybody walk here. There's no one you know, planning out where these paths will be. Yet these paths form through this spontaneous order process and they work, right? They're efficient ways to get. When I was at George Mason in the 80s, they were building so many new buildings. They were smart. They didn't pave in any paths. They waited to people walk through the dirt or the grass and saw the patterns from the bottom up that people were tracing out and then paved them in afterwards. And that's the idea of spontaneous order. In the market, right, what makes that possible? What coordinates all that behavior are prices, profits, losses and the other institutions of, of the market. And, and Hayek's argument in the use of knowledge in society is that prices – and this is my 
preferred phrase for it, but prices are knowledge surrogates. They serve in the place of that underlying knowledge. It's not as if a price gives you that knowledge, but it lets you act as if you knew all of those other things that people knew. So when a price goes up, we, we know that this good is now relatively more scarce. We know we should economize on it. We know we should be looking for substitutes. We don't need to know why. and We don't need to know the who, what. The price tells us much of the you know, substitutes for that information that we would otherwise have. But does using prices to track that knowledge, I guess, distort our knowledge as well? Because the prices then, it's not just that the prices are giving us information, but they're encouraging us to act in certain yeah. ways. And we're getting information from prices as opposed to from other sources. And so is it similar to the, you know, you look for your keys where the, the light, light yeah. is best. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, that this leads us to a market economy where people are chasing profits, chasing the highest creating prices bubbles. they can get, yeah. creating bubbles in a way that we wouldn't if we had more rational planning or other incentives or other ways of getting at knowledge that right. weren't tied to, say, greed or whatever right. else. And, and, then, yeah, and the question then is what's, what's the alternative, right? I mean, you know, Mises back in 1920 in his first contribution to the socialist calculation debate says, look, prices yeah, – I'm Yeah, I'm going to stop. Uh, yeah. I think we said socialist calculation debate yeah, a couple yeah. times. So, yeah. Yeah, so sure. clarify. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's let's we'll, we'll back up and then yeah. we'll, we'll come forward. Yeah. So, uh, uh, you know, Marx and the Marxians argued that you could plan an economy in the absence of all the institutions of the market. Right? That you wouldn't need prices, profits. You wouldn't need private property exchange. You could scientifically um, plan an economy uh, and sort of. T- you know, we could gather the necessary knowledge so that everyone or a group of people could know how to allocate resources efficiently. I mean, the, you know, we don't want to go too far into the Marxian story, but the idea was, you know, markets, capitalism are full of wasteful duplication, and people are, are doing what's profitable instead of you know what's really valuable. So, if we had planning, we would eliminate that that waste. We would eliminate the you know the exploitation of the market and alienation of the market. So the question was, could we do this? Could we actually allocate resources rationally in the absence of markets? There were several attempts to grapple with this at the turn of the century and the, the most fundamental response to it was Mises's 1920 article, uh, Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, where he laid out the argument about why you could not plan an economy. And essentially, it's this what we're talking about here. Mises said, uh, you can't know the – you can't determine – efficiency without knowing the value of resources. And the only way that you can know the relative value of resources is through prices, okay? And those prices have to be determined through exchange in a market. The only way you get exchange in a market is if you have private property, right? And and particularly, he pointed out, in the means of production and capital goods. So his argument was if you want rational economic allocation of resources, you have to have prices to be able to make the comparisons, right? So you can say, you can know technologically, I can make a bridge out of, you know, wood, steel, maybe platinum. Let's let's suppose for a moment you could do that, right? So wood, steel, platinum, right? Which one should we make it out of? How do we know, right? And we know, don't make it out of platinum because it's really expensive. It has more valuable uses. But in the absence of a market in prices, there's no way to pick among the technological solutions the one that is economically the most efficient. And that difference between sort of technological efficiency and economic efficiency was key. So Mises writes this in the 1920s, throws the challenge down. There's some responses by the Marxists, but the most interesting responses were by mainstream, then mainstream economists, particularly uh, Oscar Langa, the others as well, who argued, and here's where we get into the weeds a bit, but argued that um, the principles by which econom- the economists use the theory that economists use to talk about the market could apply equally to a socialist – so at least a system, Langa said, where the, own, where the means of production were, were so socially owned. So Langa – this got referred to as market socialism – was allowing prices back in in ways. So you know, one point you can make right here is, well, OK, then you've conceded Mises' main point. But what Langa tried to argue is you could still allocate capital from the top down by kind of mimicking the market by, by sort of throwing out prices and seeing what people would supply – would be willing to supply and demand and adjusting them accordingly. He had this whole kind of complicated system. Hayek's response, work in the 30s and 40s was a response largely to the Langa type proposals about why that couldn't work. And one of the interesting things about that, I think, is that Langa has said in his original contribution how grateful the planner should be for Mises's original 
argument because it forced them to rethink, you know, think through all these issues, that they should build a statue of Mises in the Hall of Planning to thank him, right? For you know, being that would be ironic. A little snarky. <laughs> yeah, he's been long as been a little snarky. But but I think it's fair to say that without Langa's response to Mises, Hayek would never have been pushed to develop these knowledge issues in the way that he did. And in a real equally ironic sense, modern Austrian economics owes a debt to Langa for – I don't want to build any statues or anything but but owes a debt to Langa. So uh, I think another thing to, to – for our listeners who aren't familiar with this, um, what happened for the fact that Mises was proved correct and high yeah. – what happened in the Soviet Union be, because of the lack of prices? Well, well, let's let's let me just take one other point. In the eyes of the economics profession, by the way, uh, Langa won that debate, or at least it was a draw, right? And the perception was well, Langa showed that you couldn't decide on theoretical grounds whether capitalism or socialism was better, and it really wasn't until you know the eighties. And here's where you know my own. Uh, dissertation advisor's work comes in. Don Lavoie wrote a wonderful book in the mid-'80s called Rivalry and Central Planning that the socialist calculation debate revisited where he went back and really reinterpreted what happened there and made the case that actually people misunderstood it and that Mises and Hayek were right. So that's an interesting story too. I mean Hayek once – you know, he, he, Hayek lost the two biggest debates, was perceived to have lost the two biggest debates in social science in the 20th century yet. He, and at the end of the day, he was the one still standing, which I think is is interesting. What happens in the Soviet Union? What you have there is you don't you don't have a planned economy in the full sense of the term. They still had prices, right? They were and they had world prices to look at. What you had there was sometimes called an administrative command economy. It's an economy in which prices are being set administratively from the top. It's an economy in which they're, and they're being set too low, so you constantly have shortages, and you have misallocation of resources because they can't figure out what to do with. Things you get, you know, the, the old story of the they're told the to, companies told to produce ten thousand pounds of nails, right? So they produce ten thousand pound nails, right? <laughs> and so we would never produce in terms of weight, right? We'd say what kind of nails or what kind of screws do you need, Phillips head or straight, right? So there's the market can fine tune in the ways that they could. So you had all this inefficiency there, but inefficiency that came from heavily distorted markets, from what we would today call rent seeking and and call crony socialism, right? If you want to call it that, <laughs> all right. Uh, it was, but it wasn't. It was never, with the exception of the war communism years, it was. There was never any serious attempt to fully eliminate the market. There, it was a different degree of what we've of what we've seen. But then, sort of loop back around to yeah, my yeah. my yeah, question yeah, before yeah, we yeah, wandered yeah. off into the yeah, yeah. Uh, that. So there's a there's a sense. I mean, the way that the way that these arguments get portrayed end up looking something like a market triumphalism. Right? Yeah. Like the the market is. It's not just that the market works compared to the alternatives, but the market is totally awesome. Yeah. And so the the counter to that might be that these. Yes, we have to. We may have to rely on prices, but they're distorting or not perfect in the way that we could say, like, look, if your only source of news about the world was, say, Fox News, um, we still wouldn't say, well, that's. That's wonderful. You know, it's, there are there are bad things that would happen from only getting your news from it's, Fox it's, News. It's better than being totally knowledge free, right? Yeah, yeah. I, so, so what Mises said. This I think where we left off. What Mises said in that 1920 piece was he said, "Look, there's things prices can't do. They can't tell us about beauty. They can't. But, but for the things that we need to do from day to day to day to ensure." You know, uh, progress and peace and prosperity. They do a good enough job, and it, there's, I think you know, libertarians who, who who talk about these issues have to be willing to admit: no, we can't. You know, we, prices can't tell us everything there is to know, uh, and they're not perfect either, right? We live in, as Austrian school economists would say, we live in a world of disequilibrium, right? Prices are never perfectly right. That's what entrepreneurs are for, right? To figure out when something's not right and sort of. Re, you know, make the moves to try to to to, to make those make those corrections. So I think admitting that prices can't tell us the value of everything, right? I don't put a price on my relationship with my children or things like that, right? That's that's fine. But if but if the question is how do we generate a prosperous cooperative society, prices may prices are market prices are necessary even if they're not completely sufficient for the kind of world that we might like to live in. A couple of times now we've mentioned the term Austrian economics and Hayek and Mises are the, the two giants of the modern mm -hmm. Austrian school. 
But for listeners who aren't familiar with it, can you give us the thumbnail sketch of Austrian econ and how it's different from yeah. mainstream? I'll do, I'll do the brief, very brief history and then uh, – in, in, in the 1870s, economics uh, had a major revolution known as the marginalist revolution, the idea of understanding that value was both subjective and marginal in the sense of the specific thing in front of you, right? You, you, what mattered was not the value of all water everywhere but the f- particular glass in front of you. But there were three kind of well, brands. I wanted actually just to yeah, clarify yeah. that because I remember when I was learning yeah. economics, I, 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 to, to clarify, it was the diamond water paradox. Paradox, right, so, right, yeah. And, so, and, and what did they think before? before First, how the, is this? Puzzle. I mean, it makes yeah. so much sense. Yeah. The, the puzzle was: look, wa- diamonds are frivolous, you know, luxury that we don't need to survive. Water is essential to human survival. So, why are diamonds so much more expensive than water? If water is so crucial to our survival, why isn't it more valuable? Right. And the answer is: is because we don't, when we value things, we don't value the total utility of all water everywhere or to- all diamonds. We value a particular concrete amount, right? So what's more valuable, a glass of water or a glass of diamonds? That's the question, right? And so this, you know, the, my cup of water sitting at the table here is such a small part of the total supply of water that any given decision human beings make on the margin is always about a, a specific quantity of that good, not the whole thing, right? So, so th- that got resolved but it worked kind of into three branches. The three thinkers were Carl Menger, William Stanley Jevons and Leon Val Ross and uh, they all kind of took this in different directions. Menger was Viennese. He was an Austrian and Menger took this insight in, the, in a ver- way that really focused on people's subjective perceptions of the world and their decision making. He kind of rejected the, the early mathematical attempts, not because he couldn't do math, because he didn't think it was the right way to think about economic issues. And so he, the, the, this approach to economics got tagged by its opponents as the Austrian school because, well, they were, you know, they were very psychological and all these. They're not German. Things. Yeah, they're not, and they're not German. <laughs> that's right. So, so that's how the name came. And then there's, you know, Menger's student Menger was a was the teacher of Mises, and so we get this kind of lineage that comes about. So today, how do Austrians differ today? Austrians today, the Austrian school today. Uh, starts from the assumption that what matters in economic, really social scientific analysis is, is uh, that the task of economics is to explore uh, human plans and their consequences, especially their unintended consequences. So we start with the subjective agency of human beings. We are actors. We have plans. We perceive the world in certain kinds of ways. We have means and ends and we want to achieve those ends. How do we go about doing that? And that looks a lot like mainstream economics in some sense. We're you know, economizing behavior and we you know, margin utility and those things. But what we're really interested in is how so, – so given your own perceptions of the world, how do you learn about the rest of the world? And here comes the Hayek story we've been talking about. Well, you need that information provided by prices and profits and losses and all the other institutions of the market to enable you to make those decisions, right? And that – those institutions are particular – we want to understand how those institutions make possible the coordination of the marketplace. And, when, and if it doesn't work, right, why doesn't it work? And, and then that leads to this have focus on entrepreneurs and the role that entrepreneurs play in spotting ways in which markets are not coordinated and seeing opportunities to uh, imp- uh, improve outcomes by using resources in ways that people haven't thought about before. So I'm getting the obvious example these days is Uber. Uber is just a beautiful example of, of, of two important things, entrepreneurship, that these guys realized this opportunity and took advantage of it. But, but one of the most fundamental truths about economic progress is economic progress is the progressive reduction of transaction costs, right, of making Wait, it Can easy. you define transaction yeah. costs? Yeah, yeah. 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 Of, 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 of reducing the costs of people finding and engaging in trade with each other. So. What, the fact that the Uber gets there way before the taxi and can take you to exactly where you want to go and you can do it all on your phone dramatically reduces the transaction costs of getting from here to there, right? Um, you know, you can think about eBay, right? People used to have a lot of junk in their houses. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, now what they have is what used to be other people's junk but now is their, is their <laughs> treasures, right? And so eBay has dramatically reduced the transaction costs of finding people to get rid of your junk and from the other end of that market of finding stuff you think is a treasure but someone else thinks is a junk. Well, that's the – in the transaction costs, I, I lecture, I talk about that a lot that you also realize that in the basic trading game parable that you can make the world – Way awesomer, at least in subjective yeah. present preferences, by reorganizing the stuff in it. Right, that's and right. The, and the problem is, is that you got to figure out how what kind of person wants to trade with you. And this is the story of human civilization. That's it's right. Not, it's just you have hundred right. people in a group 
or you have a thousand people in a group and now you have more trading possibilities but now you have more knowledge problems and this is when the Austrians come in with with how you in, in not just eBay first it was classified ads yep. on news, in newspapers and then Craigslist and then eBay and, yep. then, and then also in human relations you have oh, you have Tinder and you have yep. and you have all these different you know hookup e apps and things com, like that yeah. eHarmony they also diminish transaction costs and yep. it's amazing that 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 how many of those things are just standing in the way yep. of human and that's the knowledge that's the that's the and that's the Austrian point and too. and and the and, right and the freedom to trade I mean economics. It's a very Austrian point to recognize that economic act activity doesn't change the number of atoms and molecules in the world. As you said, we just reorganize stuff in ways that get things into the hands of people who value them more or transform them into things that people value more without ever changing the, the, the amount and number of molecules in the world. And that's, that is awesome, right? That Because that really gets at this point that what makes – what wealth is, is a subjective perception of us having the things that we value. I think it's a piece of junk in my basement. You think it's a treasure. We trade. And, and the knowledge is the problem. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think – And knowing that the other person – right. Knowing that the other person is there and finding ways to, to, to make that happen. And then we get in – and this goes back to the other question about what, what else besides prices. Huge issue, of course, is trust, right? And all of these ways in which we all trade has to involve trust. And as we trade gets more anonymous through these kinds of you know, internet-enabled things, we have to find more and more sophisticated ways of signaling trust. So, so you know, it's not just about prices; it's about these other kinds of features of markets too. But again, when people are free to develop these things, we can't we can't predict where you know where they'll go. Um, and, and, and that's the that's the sort of spontaneous order argument that when people are left free under the right institutional rules of the game, right? We can't let people club each other over the heads and you know steal. But but under the right rules, when people are free, we generate good results. And the and the the knowledge element is paramount. And that's mm -hmm. and and one quote that comes from Walter Williams, mm -hmm. someone yeah, you're sure. f very familiar with, about this little element of knowing and it goes back to the socialist calculation debate and everything is, is one where he says, my grocer doesn't know what I'm going to buy, when I'm going to show up or how much I'm going to buy but if he doesn't have it, I fire him. Yeah, right. And, and, and it's the amazing ability <laughs> yeah. for the economy to take all those things and put them together where you walk into the store and you take it for granted that you walk yep, into that's the store right. and you get really mad that they don't have something and all those things are what goes into the difficulty of planning. Uh, but on the Hayekian point, yeah, that's the – I think we've set a foundation but if we were going to try and explain now when someone says this is very Hayekian, right? Like what are they – like a Hayekian view of the family like your yeah. book or a Hayekian view of cities or a Hayekian view yeah. of, of paths in GMU's campus. Yeah. What, what would that – what does that mean? I think it's a recognition of the power of evolutionary forces. The uh, recognition of the limits to human humanity's ability to design social outcomes, uh, and and a recognition of the way, as as we've been saying, the way in which uh, good institutions can make can can enable us to make use of other people's knowledge in ways that enable all of us to solve problems more effectively. So I think a you know uh, a high for me. The key, at least certainly the stuff of the family, is that kind of combination of evolution and, and spontaneous order, right? Recognizing that, that, that sort of, for example, the, the family as an institution has evolved and changed in ways that no one intended or perhaps even imagined and it's done so in response to the ongoing evolution of economic and political structures and so on. And so when we – you know, people want to say so and you know, feminism wrecked the family, right? Well, no. It's, you know, it's more – we have to tell – we have to get behind that story and figure out what the forces and institutions and, and things are that, that are in place. I think we also have to – another part of that is understanding the family as an institution – as one of the institutions that frames economic activity too, right? Which is how, how does um, – not just how does the – how do economic forces affect the family but what are the functions that – the family as an institution performs in the broader spontaneous order of what Hayek called the, the great society or what Smith called the commercial society, that, that grand spontaneous order of civilization. And on that, I mean one of the things – we've been talking mostly about Hayek as an economist and he was a world-class economist but then one of the really remarkable things about his enormously rich career was he wrote 
very, very important works on topics that we don't typically think of as economics, applying these insights so into law and political philosophy. And so maybe we can neuroscience. Don't forget, can, yes. don't forget neuroscience. Yeah. Shift <laughs> into some of those and maybe yeah. talk. So after after the road to serfdom, probably his next most famous book is the Constitution of, of Liberty. Liberty. Yeah, and I think so. One of the ways to understand, as I suggested earlier, what happens after the road to serfdom is, is I think two things. Hayek wants to get his you know scientific mojo back. Right, he wants to be perceived as as not this guy who wrote this. You know, book that was turned into a cartoon, um, <laughs> and he is very frustrated at having perceived to have lost those two debates. And I think he's trying to figure out what 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 went wrong. What did what do the Keynesians not understand? What did Langa and the market socialists not understand? What didn't I communicate well? And so I think you can view the rest of his career after World War II as a bunch of attempts to address that. Constitution of Liberty, he said of it. It was his attempt to write the on liberty of the 20th century. He, he found Mill endlessly fascinating. He wanted to write something that would have the weight and impact and, and breadth of on liberty. Uh, and in Constitution of Liberty, he tries to lay out a vision of classical liberalism and of the market economy that reflects many of the things that we've been talking about that really focuses on uh, the, the, the importance of that institutional framework, about the way in which uh, uh, market and other institutions emerge and evolve spontaneously within it. Um, there's all kinds of interesting chapters in there about the political structure and how, uh, how, how uh, democratic political structures might play into that and the limits on government. And the last part of that book is a bunch of applied to particular questions at the time that, that uh, people I think who read it are shocked to see how not radical he was. <laughs> his, his, his classical liberalism was a very modest sort. But again, writing in 1960, that's understandable. So you see that. The, uh, so constitutional liberty is sort of law and political philosophy. Law, legislation and liberty, the three volumes in the 70s is kind of a reworking of that. I think he's – Hayek said at some point that even after constitutional liberty was – done. He was unsatisfied with it. He thought there were things he had to do. And I, there's a big debate about who, you know, who thinks which book is better. I, I actually find – I think law, legislation, liberty is better. I think he got it better the second time. It's the economics is a little more sophisticated. The, he's able to bring in some more evolutionary insights and things that, that just – it's richer than the first. And he, and he got more radical in his old age. I mean we can talk about denationalization of money too. Um, there's, a famous, there's a famous quote from – or a story about Hayek where he met – this was when he was in the States in the early 80s or late 70s. He met with a group of young Austrian economists, now my senior people now. But, and they were pushing him all about uh, libertarian, you know, anarcho-capitalism and pushing him, why, you know, you should think about anarchism and all this. And Hayek said, he said stop. He said, look, I'm an old man. I can't do this, right? I can't <laughs> think this way. He said, but he says, I think if I were a young man today, I would find this really, really fascinating and I would be where you guys are. So I think that's an interest. He, he could see how they were pushing him. So we, we, should, we have to talk about the neuroscience to keep, to keep everybody <laughs> yeah, exactly. happy. And I, so Hayek in his student days, Hayek wrote a – was interested in psychology and he wrote a paper on theoretical psychology uh, that proposed this kind of theory of the mind and cognition that he couldn't really s substantiate the argument at the time and he put it aside. And after, in the 40s, he came back to it for a bunch of different reasons. And I suspect that one of them was he knew from the papers on knowledge as part of the calculation debate that he had to understand something about knowledge and how the brain worked. Um, and so he went back to the – to the what, what, that paper and then read everything that was happening in sort of the neuroscience at the time, the co cognitive theory at the time and psychology at the time to figure out where it was. And it turned out – there was now more substantiation for the argument he was making. But I think what's the, the rhetoric of it I think for him was he needed a scientific basis for the subjectivism of Austrian economics. That is the idea that people perceive the world differently, the idea that knowledge is dispersed and you know, tacit and contextual, the idea that knowledge matters, that, that you know, all the things that were in those – but I think he really wanted to show – and this is part of the – get his mojo back too – that this was science. This wasn't just ideology or you know, whatever. It was science. So he writes uh, The Sensory Order, which is published in 1952, way ahead of its time in terms of how it understood – mind as an emergent phenomena from the physiology of the brain. Um, it, it's sort of anti-reductionist. Uh, it, it's, it's without being having the kind of physical evidence that modern neuroscience has because he didn't have the tools, he was absolutely on the right track. And it's a very difficult book to read unless you're into that sort of thing. But the last chapter is, is about the implications for sort of you know, methodology in the social sciences and stuff. And it really becomes clear there where he's going, which is 
this is – if I'm right, brains work a certain way and those produce certain human minds that, um, that process knowledge in certain sorts of ways. And if that's right, then this other stuff makes sense, right? So, so it was – I mean he, you know, he was – all of these things were done with a purpose. He really had an integrated social slash scientific story he wanted to tell here. So, um, which makes him, which makes him endlessly fascinating. Absolutely, right? I mean, you know, oh, he's my favorite. Yes, <laughs> um, I think there's a good, good time to uh, per- perform a Hayekian analysis uh, uh, to clarify some of these things yeah, for sure. our listeners, um, and and what this means, and the kind of things you can do Hayekian analysis on. So, let's talk about language, yeah. okay, and and. What it would mean to so how language develops yeah. and in what situations, what it would mean to plan a language right. like Esperanto right. or or Academy Francais, right? Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. then and then whether or not you could expect a planner, yeah, uh, the Esperanto. I think there's still like yeah, hundred no, thousand people who speak, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but but or Klingon, and, and, yeah, Klingon, yeah, Klingon, yeah. yeah. It. and how and how and how this stuff, sort of stuff drifts. So can you, yeah, yeah. sure, yeah, yeah there's, well, language is one of the first spontaneous order examples. Going back to the 18th century, right? people recognized that nobody, you know, there's an old Far Side cartoon with two cavemen sitting around, you know, pointing to body parts, going elbow. You know, <laughs> we know it didn't work that way, right? We we know that it, you know, from earlier, from earlier, from earlier, from simple grunts. So uh, the way that words evolve and spellings of words in English evolve, right? Uh, why certain words have meanings they don't. I mean, all these things, nobody decides that from the top down. It's decided by the users, very much like money, right? What makes something money is what people decide. Also, networking effects. Yeah, too, there's yeah. network right, and there's huge networking effects. If if only a hundred thousand people speak Esperanto or Klingon, it's really not that useful, right? If you're the only guy with a fax machine, it doesn't, right? Or, you know, <laughs> it's not not that useful. So yeah, there's network effects, um, and 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 what words get selected in, and what words get selected out. No one controls that. My 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 Saint Lawrence's school songs all seem to have the word "wended" in them. Like you wended down a hill, which is a which is a word that was very common at the turn of the you know, early 20th century, but we don't use it now, right? Why? No one said stop using wended, right? We just people change their behavior, and you can look at the way text speak has invaded our language and the way in which the internet has given us words, right, that we would never have before. It's it's this constantly growing and and usage changes too, right? All these battles over li- what literally means, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, and but but the, the beautiful part is that no one. It's a, it's it's an ongoing conversation about language, right? And no one can force a decision, and what people decide through their usage will determine it. Economy Francais, right, says don't use the word weekend because it's a you know right, but people use it, right? Or you know, they, no one listens to them because <laughs> because usage matters, and it's also why the artificial languages are difficult to get going because. There's an advantage to the bottom-up growth of language. Just like those footpaths, right? You know where people want to walk if you wait, right? So when you let language bubble up from the bottom, you actually get language that's more effective because people have chosen these words because they think they convey a meaning and they've been able to effectively communicate with them. Top down, you can't you can't know that. And you could draw the analogies to markets here, right? Yeah, well, I yeah. think that Hayek would use a, a term which I think we should uh, clarify and define for something like Esperanto. I mean, it may be it may be, but the term rational constructivism, right? Uh, right. What, what is that term? Yeah, and and what Hayek meant there was was again this idea of trying to uh, create top down through human sheer sort of rationality to construct something new that was completely detached from tradition and history. One of the interesting things in Hayek is is his relationship with tradition and he's very respectful but not reverent of tradition because tradition carries that weight of history and of usage and of, of success with it. And so we have to recognize there's a reason we do things the way we do things. So what Hayek says is you can't you can't throw everything out and start anew. You can critically examine a piece of the social world and sort of ask whether this works or doesn't work, but you're always doing it against the background of these other things and whether it fits. So you can, for example, the debate over same-sex marriage would be an obvious example here. You know, and it's an interesting question: What would Hayek say? But but that there's no reason to think Hayek wouldn't say. We can talk about this question, right, and think about the evolution of this institution because it has evolved over time. Is this the next step? Are we designing something from the bottom up new? I don't think we are, right? Are we critically assessing how we've taken an existing rule, treat people equally and apply it here? So there's all kinds of ways that you can, you can do this without thinking you can 
reconstruct the institution of marriage from the top down like we just tore it up and started over. That's what you really can't do. Then how does the – how do his views on law and so the emergence of common law and law versus legislation yeah. Yeah. fit into all of this? So he, he was a great fan of common law because it's another one of these spontaneous order bottom-up processes. But he recognized too that, that you know, the law can sometimes get into a dead end or a cul-de-sac, right, where, where – that historical process puts it in a place where now doing things the way we've done them doesn't make any sense. And my favorite example of this is the debates over copyright and music sharing and all this kind of thing. We took a consistent idea about the importance of copyright and kept applying it, but we were now in a world where the, the scarcity constraints were different, right? And the technology was different. And so in those places, Hayek says, that's where you know judges can, through the common law, sometimes paint themselves into a corner. And that for Hayek was one of the roles of legislation, that is of government, to sort of step in and say, can we now fix this law. But it was always about making it align better with the rest of the system. It had to be consistent with the rest of the, of the system. It was repairing a hole in the fabric, not, not designing a whole new thing. And so that – and that's a very – if you know your Karl Popper, right? It's a kind of Popper, Popper called piecemeal social engineering, right? I think that's a little stronger than Hayek would put it. But it's the same basic idea that we can fix these holes but we always have to do it against the larger fabric that we're working on. In, uh, in Rules and Order, uh, which is the first volume of Law, Legislation and Liberty, Hayek has really interesting observations, uh, I would call them for when I read it, mind-blowing, um, about where rules come from. So it's not just economies that are planned. It's also the possibility that, that law yeah. – how, how, can, how does that work? Well, the, I mean, again, we, you know, where, where does the law come from? The law is a problem solver, right? All institutions solve problems. Markets solve problems. The law solves problems. People have a dispute. They take it to a third party. Third party, they both agree. Third party renders a decision. That decision becomes potentially precedent. Think about our discussion of language, right? It's one contender, right? Other judges face similar situations. They look at what other judges have decided. And then so we see this build up over time, right, where what emerges out of this individual problem solving and dispute settling instances is a body of fairly consistent, fairly coherent, well-known rules that become that become the law. And so it's not again, we, we have this notion of the law giver, right? The the person or entity who sat down and, and wrote out the law, but that's just as silly as the far side cartoon about naming the body parts, right? The law evolved and emerged. What Hayek refers to as legislation is is, is the role of government, you know, legislative bodies, government uh, in in correcting those errors that we've talked about but also in laying down the internal rules for government itself. So Hayek wants to distinguish between the role – government's role in setting the rules of the game and the, and the role of government and government actors in directing government as an organization, right? Because he's not an anarchist and there's things government should do and we need rules for that and we need processes for that. That's what – that's this notion of legislation. Law, on the other hand, is is these sort of the rules of just conduct, these these framework type rules, and that's why in Law, Legislation, Liberty, Volume Three, in his attempt to some would say rationally construct the political <laughs> order, he sort of comes up with this model constitution, and there's some interesting stuff in there. But he has two different bodies responsible for law, you know, one for law and one for legislation, because he thinks those are so distinct and such distinct. When I teach the to Hayek's view of law, well, rules in specific, mm -hmm. because. He has a lot of observations about how there are all these – again, going back to tacit knowledge, yeah. there are rules that you follow that you know that you don't even know that you right. know them and that the only thing that make social – like society work and specifically when people are together, physically together and they might step on each other's toes. And I and I, my teaching tool for that is actually playing clips of Seinfeld yes. because Seinfeld is entirely yeah. about – all breaking matters. breaking yeah. rules that you didn't even know existed until right. someone breaks them. Right, right. Like, double dipping, like, double, double dipping, dipping. talking, right. too right. close talking. Into right, your, yeah. you know, right in your face. So what is yeah. the you know? If you tried to legislate from the top down, this is exactly how far people have to talk from each other. But there are all these rules there, that, and you know it. And the thing about those rules is you know it when they're violated. You might yes. not be able to articulate what it is, but you know it when it's when it's violated. Or the rule of putting your uh, bag on a seat in a crowded cafeteria. And having it be there when you come back, right? turning on your parking signal to indicate you want that space. Yeah. Right? I mean, these are all these again, all these little social norms and rules that have evolved that nobody invented, but that we, you know, we we have developed out of practice, like the law, like money. Like and that would be the Hayekian view of something yeah. like 
another thing that we could have a hiking view of in terms of rules and is traffic. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. different everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. And and notice too, right? This is the interesting thing. There's scope within this for cultural variation. That 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 it doesn't, you know, people who often perceive free market types as sort of saying, well, everyone's got to look like us. No, I mean the, the, the rules will vary by local circumstances. We do know that there's certain, you know, that, that, that societies that want to be peaceful and proper, prosperous and so on uh, have to have the same general types of rules, but they don't have to be the same. They don't have to be exactly the same everywhere as long as they work for that population. You mentioned a couple of times Hayek is a classical liberal, but you said as um, when talking about the end of constitutional liberty, that he was not a radical um, in any way. So I'm curious about how he fits into the libertarian tradition. Is he yeah. is Hayek a? I mean, we draw here at the Cato Institute. We have the F.A. Hayek Auditorium where we hold all our events. I mean, clearly we're fans, yeah, but pictures of him everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> how does how does he fit into libertarianism? Yeah. Well, I think two things. I think uh, here's here's the way to put it. You can use Hayek's insights to make a much more radical argument for libertarianism than Hayek himself did. I mean, you know, I, you know, if it catch me on the right day and I'll call myself a Hayekian anarchist because I think you can – when you really understand the richness of spontaneous order and the, um, you know, all this stuff we've been talking about, right, it becomes difficult particularly if you now throw public choice insights on top of it, right, to, to, to – and sort of recognize the limits of the state to think what the state can do effectively. But, you know, that aside, I think the more general point is that, that Hayek's – analytical framework, Hayek's intellectual system uh, undergirds a lot of the arguments that, that modern libertarians make even if Hayek himself was not willing to draw the same or as radical political conclusions out of them. And I think that's, that's, that's the key to me, right? Is it uh, – you know, oftentimes it's a game that our friends on the left like to play is, oh, you love Hayek but Hayek, ah, he, he believed this thing about you know, universal basic income or something that you guys reject. So therefore – and I want to go, therefore what, right? Do, do, do you guys not draw on Marxian insights yet? You don't – right? I mean does that somehow invalidate? No. It's just it's that, that we're not – I think it's important for modern libertarians to not be uh, worshippers of, of, of a thinker to the point where the only way you can agree with that thinker is to agree with everything, right? And everyone's either a white hat or a black hat sort of thing. No. Use, use his insights to develop arguments that go beyond him. That's, that's what we do. That's great. For listeners who found this interesting, have not necessarily read Hayek in the past but want to explore more, where is the best place to start? Oh, I love this question. Um, I think it depends on, on what your interests are. I, I actually think for the general kind of reader, Road to Serfdom or Constitution of Liberty are probably the best place to start. If you are a little more sophisticated, you can jump to law, legislation and liberty right away. It, that and Constitution of Liberty are fairly substitutable. If you're interested in the economics, the book to read is his collection of essays called Individualism and Economic Order, which is still in print. That's got all these knowledge essays from the from the from the thirties and, and, and forties. That's I mean, if, when I teach Hayek or I teach a class in Austrian economics, that's the book I use for Hayek because that's where all the action is. You know, for the more professional economists out there, there's other things that they might touch. But I think for for the general listener interested in libertarianism. Uh, those would be the, the four I would talk about. Uh, individual and econom individualism and economic order, constitution of liberty, road to serfdom, and law legislation. Particularly the first two volumes. No one really needs to read the, the third volume. Except the epilogue, which is great. Epilogue's great. But people should absolutely read higher. Yes, they should. Yes. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.